Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com. Every week, we interview professionals to discuss their work and allow you to ask questions. And of course, this is made possible by our sponsors, OWC. For more information on how you, they can assist you in your filmmaking needs, go to owcdigital.com. And this week, I'm joined by Oscar-winning editor Paul Hirsch, whose work includes Carrie, Star Wars, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Footloose, Trains, Planes, and Automobiles, Steel Magnolias, among so many others. And then he just released this new book, or his new memoir, a long time ago in a cutting room far, far away. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, I guess to, to start off, um, when I was reading your book, uh, you decided you seem to have decided or you decided to make it more a memoir as opposed to, you know, like I think of Walter Murch's In the Blink of an Eye or one of those where it's sort of examining the, the craft itself. Um, and in this process of making it a memoir, you made it really truthful. Um, what was, I guess, when you were starting this, this um, memoir out, what was your, your process behind it? And what were you thinking in terms of, like, I would be, personally, I'd be worried about being so truthful in my book. So how, where did you draw the line for yourself in that? Well, um, uh, I, I had been telling these stories, uh, you know, when there's downtime for the editor. So you, you walk over to the set and you chat with people. You like to meet the actors and talk to the director, the producer, whatever. And, um, and you know, there's a lot of waiting around on the set. So I would be telling stories about things that had happened to me in my life. I was on location in British Columbia around 1999. I think I was working on um, uh, Mission to Mars with Brian De Palma. And my wife had elected to stay back in LA. So on the weekends I was alone and I thought, you know, I should start writing these stories down. Uh, and that's how it started. I just, I, I had been telling these stories and I thought I should, I just, just write them down. And then the idea of making a book sort of came subsequently. Um, and very early in the process, at that point I was about 30 years into my career. And uh, I made a list of the movies I'd worked on and I, and I made little uh, reminders of the people I'd worked with and anecdotes of things that had happened with them just to jog my memory. And I made a list of things that I intended to write about. The story about this, the story about that, when this happened, this guy, you know, so forth. So, um, so if I hadn't done that, I doubt very much if starting today I could remember everything that I that I wrote about. But um, mm -hmm. at that time, you know, I had a very clear memory of those things. And then in the next 20 years, I, you know, more things happened that were good stories. And uh, I, I would make notes about them. And then I would always refer to this when I was doing the book. So the first draft took me 18 years. I would put it aside for two or three years at a time if I got very busy. And then um, as my, you know, as I pursued my career arc, it's called an arc for a reason, because whatever goes up must come down. And uh, I found that my uh, my free time was growing and I uh, worked more and more on the book. So I finally finished it after, I finished the first draft after 18 years. Wow. And then um, a friend from childhood, uh, Nicholas Meyer, who directed the, the good Star Trek movies and The Day After Tomorrow um, offered to, he said, I'll edit it for you. I said, great. So he, he was the first person to read the book. And rather than edit it, he would say to me, well, how did you feel when this happened to you? You know, he, he's the son of a, of a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So he was asking me, you know, tell me more about how you felt about this. About <laughs> it. So it wasn't really an editing job, but he gave me a lot of very good suggestions and good notes and introduced me to his, uh, his, his um, literary agent. And then she, uh, agreed to take the book on, but it was felt it was much too long and introduced me to an editor who did a fabulous job. Her name is Jennifer Shute. We never met. We did everything by phone and email. I never even FaceTimed with her. I don't know what she looks like. Yeah. She was a great editor. And that portion of the process was very familiar to me because editing the book was very similar to editing a movie. 
uh, and various people weighed in when we got a publisher that the you know they have they would give me notes and you know and your reaction you know when you're working on a movie or a book your reaction to the notes is always the same you say i'm not going to do that forget it i'm not doing that and then you think about it and you think well maybe there's a way i can i can do something with that you know maybe, maybe there is something there you know so and but you know so familiar with that process i think uh, i had a lot of help and uh, the truthfulness of the book is you know it's 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 like editing you don't know what i left out <laughs> well that was going to be one of my questions what was left on the cutting room floor for the book yeah well one of the things that uh the literary agent said to me was we don't want any uh score settling you know shouldn't include any score settling and i wasn't sure about that because i really wanted to you know nail some of these people that i work with <laughs> uh that I, you know but but then about that time comey came out with this book about trump mm. he talked about his arm skin and his little hands and and he got more criticism for that than anything he wrote about trump so so you know anything else he wrote about him so i thought well there's a lesson there you know um i'm not going to cast any shade on anyone yeah you know? and anyway you know I've, I've had extraordinary luck in my career i've worked with some extraordinary people and uh you know i i've had so much luck that it would be it would be uh wrong to be whining about this guy didn't listen to me or he didn't take my advice or he was rude to me or he was insensitive or you know uh nobody wants to hear that i i, I say uh my motto is there's no moaning on the yacht yeah. <laughs> you're on the yacht shut up and enjoy it you know yeah don't complain so I've sort of been on a yacht in my career and I, I just, I left out the moaning part. Now you, you mentioned, uh, you know, you were talking about the arc and coming back down, but in the book, you talk about ups and downs in the career. And uh, that's something that a lot of young editors don't realize in film that you're going to have ups and downs from like huge successes to huge, you know, movies that don't do as well. Um, so well, we call those flops. Yeah. <laughs> what, what would your advice be to young, young editors about that and how to just, tackle that? Just keep going, you know, just uh, take what comes and, and uh, keep working as much as possible. Um, the challenges you face on, on each project, you know, will, will uh, help you grow in your craft. What's interesting though, is like, like, because, um, you know, like we bought, I've watched the Bob Evans doc. I've watched, uh, you know, there's a movie called Box Office Boffo uh, where they explored, you know, what makes a successful film, what makes a f failure. And what they found was um, that no one can predict it. No one can predict what's going to succeed. Right. So was there a film that you worked on that you're like, I really love this film and I'm excited for it. And then it just didn't hit that people should check out. Well, I mean, there are a number of films that uh, we thought, you know, were going to be fantastic successes that were flops. I mean, when Phantom of the Paradise came out, we expected it to be well received. And in fact, I think the Daily News in New York gave it half a star or something. I mean, it was a tremendous disappointment when it opened. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, it developed a, um, a sort of a cult following. In fact, in Winnipeg, in in your country, yeah, there's an annual uh, Phantom Palooza. Oh, really? Um, they have a festival centered around the picture. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, you know, there's. I thought that would be a big success. I thought Obsession would be a bigger success than it was. Uh, I write in the book about uh, planes, trains, and automobiles uh, going into the first preview. I thought this was the funniest movie I'd ever seen mm -hmm. and people were started walking out and that that was a shocker um and the the eventual uh, shaping of that movie and go i go into great detail in the book uh, mm -hmm. quite an interesting story from from an editing standpoint you know when, when you started out saying that my book was unlike walter's um you know walter's much more of an intellectual than i am and uh, I had not intended to write a how-to book. I find those very boring, you know, how to edit. 
uh, I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to tell stories, you know, but um, uh, I found that in telling my stories, I was describing some of the things that you that you do in in trying to get a picture from not working to working. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, I surprised myself by finding that you know some of my readers wrote me said that they found it really instructive, which was never my intention, but I'm happy with that. You know, if if people can learn from it, then it's fine. But uh, yeah. So now you also talk about uh, the impact the film like the film career can have on a family so what would you what would your advice be to young young filmmakers and editors uh as they make their journey in their careers well you 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 try to manage things as as well as you can i mean i had a tremendously supportive uh spouse who uh you know she was at the very beginning of her first pregnancy and encouraged me to go on location, which I thought was extremely generous and brave. Uh, my advice is, you know, marry somebody wonderful. That, that would be my, my best advice on that. But uh, it's a demanding job in terms of hours. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it hasn't gotten any better. I think, I, I think with this working at home that, that has developed in the last year, year and a half, uh, is very uh, worrying because, in fact, it's not just the film business. I mean, everybody is subject to, uh, it seems, you know, late night texts and, and weekend phone, you know, messages. Mm -hmm. It seems like everybody's expected to be on all the time. So I think we have to guard against that. Now we have a question from Tim and he's asking, uh, Star Wars was famously saved in the edit. Is there an example that comes to mind uh, of the opposite in a film? So a film you worked on that seemed to fail in, uh, fall into place without much resistance? Well, first of all, I don't think Star Wars was saved in the edit. I think it was just a normal editing process that films go through. Star Wars was subjected to a kind of scrutiny that very few pictures uh, are subjected to, and um, what they, you know, what I mean, it's very nice to be complimented and all that. But in fact, what they were describing and observing is the normal process that you do in any film, you know, mm -hmm. of trying to get it from, you know, almost working to really working, you know. So, uh, um, so there's that. Uh, it was a lot of work. It was started off in the wrong direction and changing course is sort of like, you know, the proverbial turning an oil tanker around, uh, especially when you're working on film, there's a lot of unsplicing and resplicing that has to, that had to be done. So, um, a film, you know, then there are other films like Empire Strikes Back, uh, really just worked. I mean, we locked the, the the shooting schedule went over by 13 weeks. We were supposed to shoot 16 weeks. They shot 29. So uh, that was supposed to be post-production time. But in fact, the script worked so well and, and uh, you know, we were able to lock picture uh, one month after the end of principal photography. So it just sort of fell into place. And in those days, when you're working on film, when you lock something, you locked it. That was, mm -hmm. you know, it was much too uh, complicated to to make a lot of changes at the eleventh hour. Well, it had to go off the VFX and sound, and work yeah. now where it's yeah. well, and it's, it's interesting because you kind of you alluded to it a bit earlier about uh, you know people being able to get contacted, at, you know, cold or text late at night and stuff, and in your book there's sort of an at the end you sort of talk about the digital revolution and how it's um has a destructive nature i was wondering if you could go into that uh, and what your thoughts are on the evolution of what we're seeing in in film well first of all i mean the digital aspect of it is one thing and then streaming is another and then addressing the digital aspect first you have um it's a tremendous tool for the editor in fact, I wrote a little piece for the Editors Guild magazine called How the How the Avid Made the Work Easier and the Job Harder, because mm -hmm. 
by speeding up the process, uh, it, it, be, it starts to engage people who have very sh brief attention spans. And in the past, they would leave you alone because it was so boring, you know. But all of a sudden now it became interesting because they could see things happen before their eyes. And uh, you have a lot of interference from people who have no business being in a cutting room. Um, and then the other aspect of it is the wonderful thing is that you can save versions, but it's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know. You can save versions, but if you have an indecisive director, uh, you know, who can't choose between different versions, then you created a nightmare for yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, it, like everything else, it cuts both ways. It, there's pluses and minuses. Um, yeah, and then as, as far as the streaming aspect is concerned, I'm really uh, kind of unhappy about that because the films, you know, when we came, when our, my generation came into the business, we were uh, inspired by the movies we were seeing uh, at the cinemas. And uh, these were stories, they were two hour stories that had a beginning, a middle and an end. And yes, there were sequels and, and franchises, you know, Andy Hardy made, I don't know how many versions of Andy Hardy they made. And James Bond was already making, uh, you know, series of films, but the stories generally were two hour stories with a, with a clear story arc. and and a whole world you could inhabit and feel like you've been to some place or some time and, 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 you know, left the, the mean streets of New York and gone to, you know, 14th century England for a while. Or something. So, um, you know, those stories are what inspired us to become filmmakers. But now, instead of stories, they're looking for content, you know, and, and by thinking of it as content, I imagine these, you know, these sort of big bins, they have these enormous bins of time that they have to fill up. So Netflix has all these bins and they, well, how can we fill all this time, you know? Well, let's take this story and, and maybe we can make it a four hour story, six hour, eight, 10, 12 hour story, you know? Mm -hmm. And then what happens is the, the stories don't get a chance to find their own length. They have to fill up the bin, you know? So um, I find that a lot of the, you know, too many of, of too much of what I see in those longer stories feels attenuated and, you know, pulled like taffy, you know, the, mm -hmm. the stories just stops moving forward and there's a side subplot or some, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's damaging to storytelling. You well, have to fill up time, huh? Well, I was going to say, and I've seen numerous doc they're now doing multiple, you know, like here's a six part doc and it's like, that could have been three, <laughs> you know? Like you were saying, stretching it out. They're not letting films find their own length. It's, yeah. it's you know, you need to paint this this wall. You need to, you need to paint the house. Keep painting. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, if you run out of ideas, you know we got to cover the whole wall. You know, so now, uh, it's badly here. I have Lynn wants to know. Uh, she was wondering if you could discuss uh, what do you look for in making a good cut, and uh, from one frame to another. She was wondering. From one frame to another? Yeah. Is there anything you you look for technique-wise? Well, I mean, there's so many, you know, there, there's so many possibilities. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to know how to answer that. <laughs> uh, first of all, you don't start looking at frames uh, at first. Uh, you're talking about cutting action or you're cutting dialogue, you know, and then you know, each each piece of film that you're looking at contains or, or lacks uh, a rhythm to it. If it's a piece of action, there's a beginning, a middle and an end to the action and the distance between and the time between the, the beginning of the action, the middle and the end creates a tempo. Mm -hmm. Same with dialogue. There are some actors who speak very quickly and some who speak very slowly. So uh, you sort of be, you have to be sensitive to the rhythms of the material you're, you're cutting. Uh, I don't start fussing with frames initially unless, you know, when I make a cut, I would, I would, I compare it mentally to uh, a sense of, is it, is it right or is it not right? If I have referred to the whole process of editing is that 
that game of, you know, what's wrong with this picture? You're playing, what's wrong with this picture? Mm-hmm. You know, they used to have these features in the newspapers where you'd have a, a cow on top of the house or, you know, the dog would have five legs or, you know, things like that you'd have to catch. And cutting a movie is like that. You look at it and you, you think, what's wrong with this picture? And there are things that, that uh, when you watch them, you go, oh, that's, that doesn't feel right. And um, that's too short. Uh, that's too long, that's in the wrong place, whatever it is, there, there are things that occur to you. Um, so, yeah, and then the frame, you know, again, it, it's so, it's so uh, varied, I can't really address the frame issue. Now, I have another question, it just, it goes off screen, so I just have to look over here. Yes. Uh, this is from Lisa, and she says, in features, the director is supposed to have the final say over the cut, unlike scripted television, where the producers do. Uh, Did you ever find yourself in a situation where the studio tried to take the picture away from the director and make you you answer only to them? If so, how did you deal with that situation? Yeah, again, those situations are all unique and Mm -hmm. uh, there's no real general rule you can apply, uh, general, you know, to, to universally to all these situations, but I'll just say this, that it's beyond the editor's capacity to have the, uh, the people who are paid much more money than we are and who may have uh, contending opinions and, and, excuse me, conflicting opinions. It's beyond our capacity to get them to reach a consensus. They have to do that for themselves. Editors are in the suggestion business. We have to accept that, you know. Uh, it's a subordinate job. Uh, we are subordinate either to the director or the producer or the studio. Uh, who holds the power between those three uh, power sources is something that has to be worked out uh, among them. I generally follow the rule that I, I support, you know, politically, I feel bound to support whoever hired me. And so if the director hires me, I'll support the director. If the studio has hired me, um, if the studio has hired me, I, I, I do it on the proviso that I, I'm not acting in anyone else's behalf. If they want me, like if I get called in on a picture to, to, that they feel is in trouble and would benefit from fresh eyes, I tell them that I, I don't want to do your notes. I'll, I'll do what I think is right for the picture, and then you can decide what you want to do. But um, So I don't know if that's helpful or not. I hope it is. Now, in another interview that I saw with you, you, you discussed or you mentioned that uh, you saw that there was a close relationship between the editor and music and dance. And yes. I was wondering if you could explain that uh, relationship to us. Well, editing is all about time, and music is, and dance are all about time. You know, the, the man named Ricciotto Canudo uh, was an early film theoretician. He wrote a piece about 1911 or so, where he described the six arts. Uh, he described the rhythms of space and the rhythms of time. And the rhythms of space, he grouped painting, sculpture, and architecture. And the rhythms of time, he had um, music, uh, poetry, and dance. And he considered film to be the seventh art. And, you know, all those other arts, the, the only one that involves, you know, po- poetry involves rhythm, but it doesn't involve time. Um, the same could be said of, uh, well, dance is set to music, so it's, there's an intimate relation. So I'd say dance, music, and editing are very similar. <coughs> Excuse me, a choreographer is organizing movement in a three-dimensional space against music or against something. And uh, an editor is organizing movement in a two-dimensional plane, sometimes to music, but sometimes to these other rhythms that I was talking about earlier. So there's a strong connection between uh, music and editing. It's all about timing. And you also, if I'm not mistaken, you also studied architecture at one point. Well, I did, but I also studied music and I also studied art history. So... I spent more time studying music and art history than I did studying architecture. I I had intended to become an architect when I left college, 
<laughs> but I found very quickly that it was too dry and academic for me, and I wanted something with a little more juice. Yeah, and, uh, I think you found it, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, wh what I'd like to know is, uh, what did you like about doing your job? Okay, now, you know, you sent me this question, and uh, I thought it was, um, I mean, you, you asked me when we spoke earlier, mm -hmm. what question have you never been asked? And I, I think I suggested this to you. So yeah. I prepared my, my answer. I think it's a very good, uh, good idea to ask an interviewee what they've never been asked before. Oh, thank you. So uh, here's what I wrote. I enjoy finding a path through the dailies, mm -hmm. making sure that all the best bits are included and building a scene out of the dailies. I love cutting to music. It's like dancing effortlessly. I love finding the perfect piece of music for a scene. I love coming up with ideas I'm not sure are going to work and then trying them out and seeing that they do. And then I love when the director agrees with me. And then again, when the audience confirms it, uh, I love working closely with directors, but only if they like and appreciate my suggestions. Uh, I love impressing directors. I love closing the door and concentrating on what I'm doing. And while I'm working, time does not exist. I have loved the camaraderie with the assistants, the music editor, the VFX people, uh, the sound editors. I love mixing. I love working on comedies, but only when they're funny. I love hearing the audience laugh. And all this has happened to me a lot, but not always. Wow. Now, the, um, I had one other question that I like to do is my last question, but we discussed a bit before um, you're currently watching a lot of uh, older films right now on the criterion channel. Is there a, a film that you think people should check out that they have, that a lot of the younger viewers might not have seen? Yeah. I mean, uh, there's two films by, by Lena Vertmuller, uh, who was the first woman ever nominated for an Academy award as a director. Uh, one is called Love and Anarchy, and the other is called, um, of course, I'm going to not be able to remember it now. Uh, Love and Anarchy, and I'll come back to that. And then uh, there's a great film, some of the, uh, the neorealist Italian films. Mm -hmm. I saw one recently called Germany Year Zero, which was absolutely devastating. It was shot in Germany in 1946 or seven, and the country is in absolute ruins. It's, it's astounding to see, uh, and it's a fabulous picture about uh, children trying to survive by scavenging in the streets, you know, anything they can find uh, to, to try and, and survive in that, in that environment. Um, uh, can't remember the other Vertmuller film, but uh, yeah, and then um, Rome Open City is a wonderful picture. The Bicycle Thief, Thieves, you know, it was always called The Bicycle Thief all my life. And then I looked at the title and it's, it's plural in Italian. And all of a sudden now everybody's calling it The Bicycle Thieves. Yeah, it was, I was thinking about that recently, actually, <laughs> when you said The Bicycle Thief, I was like, which one is it? Because they keep seeing the, the differences. It's thieves. Interesting. And I'd heard about Shusha, Shushine, yeah. which I'd heard about and never seen. And you know, these, these old films are really wonderful. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for letting me interview. Well, you're welcome. And for those who want to see more, you can check more out on our YouTube channel. And again, thank you to owcdigital.com for sponsoring this episode. Again, thank you, Paul. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. You're welcome. All right.